morning, church. Good morning. I know there's still a few finding their way in, making their way up the stairs. And so, you know what? It's been a little while. Let's go ahead, pop up, go walk around, say good morning. So, Harry hasn't even sat down yet. He knew it was coming. Harry knew it was coming. <laughs> I just want to we begin this morning, just encourage us to continue to, as we talked about a little bit last week, just bear one another's work burdens, continue to lift one another up in prayer, uh, as just the, we, we continue to, to do life together, step into these next several weeks together. And these next several weeks uh, are going to be a little bit of a, a, a busy few weeks here. Uh, we have uh, coming up, beginning tomorrow night, Rollinsville Camp Meeting. This is something I I push every year since I started here at Corey Rollinsville Camp Meeting is a place that I came to know the Lord as a young, awkward 13-year-old. I'm now an awkward 31-year-old and uh, still still walking with the Lord. But uh, I, I would encourage you, if you've never experienced Robinsville Camp Meeting, to, to please uh, try it even just one night over these next two weeks. This is a, it's, a, it's a great year. Uh, we have uh, two of the all-stars of Robinsville Camp Meeting. This first week, we have Jim, Jim Ehrman speaking. He's the former dean in the theology department at Yale. So uh, the brilliance of Jim is that he's going to talk about really complex things, but he's going to bounce around to about 30 different things uh, in one moment. And so it's, it's incredible to listen to how his brain works. I love hearing Jim speak. And the second week, we have Bert Jones, just an incredible down-to-earth, mission-minded uh, pastor. And so I encourage you, again, uh, the, the evening services start each night at 7.30, go till 9, come out. Enjoy the evening service. Get the best milkshake you've ever had. Uh, if you're inclined, uh, we're beginning uh, tonight. Uh, camp doesn't officially start until tomorrow night at 7.30, but I'll be kicking things off tonight in the tabernacle at 7 o'clock with a spiritual life rally. Uh, the spiritual life rally in years past has been something to just get camp started with a bang, to, to rally people to an exciting two weeks of camp. The main topic I'm speaking on tonight is rest. So I'm calling this a rally to rest and a little bit of an oxymoron, but I am uh, very much excited uh, to kick things off tonight. So I invite you to, to, to join me there tonight. Uh, and the church, I do just have uh, one more announcement this morning. Uh, many of us in this body are aware of what uh, our spiritual, or I'm sorry, what our worship director, uh, Patrick, and his wife, Leanne, have been walking through these last several weeks with uh, the birth of their son, Caden, uh, and Friday evening, uh, Patrick and Leanne uh, got to hold him as he went to be in the arms of Jesus. And it has been an incredibly hard last five weeks uh, for them, and I, I've said it when we, when we spoke about it a few weeks ago, it has been incredible to see the way this church has rallied around them and continues to come around them and has just continued to reach out to them, provide for them, pray over them especially. 
And so as they uh, continue in this season, would you just continue to pray for them? Uh, the plan at this time, uh, just to, to make you aware, the plan at this time is to celebrate Peyton's life. Uh, this coming Saturday, it's August 5th at 11 a.m. at Wesley, Maine. Uh, that is the, the plan at this time. And so I would just invite you to, to join us for that, to join us for that celebration. It has been uh, a very heavy season, but we just want to continue to surround Patrick and Leanne, just continue to love on them uh, as they uh, obviously celebrate the life of this beautiful baby boy, but as we step into a, a season of mourning and a season of grief as a church body, uh, I would invite you to that this Saturday. And just continue, please, just continue to lift up Patrick and Leanne in prayer, continue to surround them with love, to reach out to them as, as the Lord calls you to. And this morning, as we prepare our hearts for worship, uh, I want to read from Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 through 7. It says, But now, thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by my name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And, though, and uh, through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you. Because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you, I give men in return for you, peoples in exchange for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east, and from the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Here in Isaiah, we get a reminder that when we are walking through those difficult seasons, when it feels like the darkness is all around us. And again, I know for many of us right now, it feels like we're, we're walking through one of those seasons of life. And it's just a beautiful reminder for us that we are still called by his name. I called you by not my name. And listen to these three words. You are mine. The Lord is reminding us all throughout his scriptures. When you pass through the waters, when you walk through the rivers, when you're walking through fire... I am with you every step of the way. It's a beautiful reminder of what we see with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as they go into the fiery furnace. And when Nebuchadnezzar's men look in, they say, there is a fourth, and he is like the Son of Man. That is the same Jesus who's go who goes with us when we walk through the waters, when we walk through the rivers, when we walk through the fires of life. He still goes with us. For I am the Lord your God the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. That is who we worship today. No matter what season of life we're walking through, no matter what valley we might find ourselves in, I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. As we reflect on those words, as we prepare to worship, would you pray with me this morning? Jesus, I thank you for those three words. That simple reminder that we need to provide for ourselves very often and that you provide for us over and over and over again throughout the scriptures. You are mine. Jesus, we are going to see this morning as we look at Matthew chapter 3, as we see your humility, as we see how you kick off your ministry, we are going to see that reminder that not only we are yours, but Lord, you are enough. Lord Jesus, you are enough for us. We don't have to hold on to the things of this world. We don't have to have you plus other things. Jesus, you are enough, and we thank you for that this morning. So Jesus, for those in our church body this morning, even as we stand in the lobby and just to talk through the difficulties of what we're walking through, and the, the busyness and the difficulties of the seasons of life that we're in, Jesus, uh, Father, I pray for this church body. Uh, I pray that you would continue to foster vulnerability, uh, Jesus, that we would be just direct and upfront with one another, Lord, that we wouldn't have
have this, this need or this tendency to, to hide when we're walking through difficult things, but that we would be vulnerable with one another. And Lord, I pray for just a spirit-led drive in our hearts that when someone in our body, when someone around us is walking through those valleys, is going through that difficult season, is Jesus, would you give us the strength to go with them the way that you go with us when we walk through those seasons? A part of being a part of the body of Christ is never walking through anything alone. Lord, that means that you go with us. And would you would we just feel your presence in a very real way this morning? And Jesus, it means that we go alongside one another as well. In the same way that we see you come alongside people all throughout the gospels and provide for those needs and, and provide care where it's needed and love on people radically. Would that continue to be the heartbeat of our church, Lord? That we would know one another well and deeply, and that it would lead to just a deeper and deeper love for one another. And that we just continue to lead to, to serving one another and stepping up when one another needs us. Jesus, I thank you for the heart of that that I've already seen over these last several weeks. It has been a difficult season. It continues to be a difficult season for this church body. And yet, there has not been division where there has been unity. And that is the prayer of our hearts. That will continue this morning. Jesus, we thank you. We pray, we pray right now. You with Emily. She leads us in worship. As we come to the throne of grace, uh, would you just lead us into that spirit of surrender right now? Uh, Lord, as we uh, so often come into this building with anxieties or stresses or worries about something that's going on now or something that is to come, Jesus, would you just Holy, fix our eyes on the throne of grace right now as we worship you. As we worship you, we love you and we thank you for this morning. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and worship this morning.
ahead and dismiss any kids to head downstairs for Kids Church. If we have any hands for it, we do. There we go. Well, church, this morning, uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, I'm going to turn to you. We're going we're to dive right in here this morning. Uh, last week, we began to look at uh, Matthew chapter 3. For those, if this is your first Sunday here this morning, uh, we are embarking on uh, a look at the book of Matthew, going chapter by chapter, verse by verse through the book of Matthew. Um, we've been moving at a pretty steady clip with the exception of, obviously, June and our outdoor services. Uh, but I can, I can tell you right now here, uh, after this week, over the next couple of weeks, we'll continue to move at a steady clip through chapter 4. Uh, when we hit the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 5, we might, we might be there for a little while as we dissect uh, some of Jesus' most difficult and complex teachings. Uh, but last week, we looked at Matthew chapter 3. We looked at verses uh, 1 through 12 of chapter 3. And what we saw last week were, were a few things. First, we saw the person of John the Baptist. We looked a little bit about who this person was. Uh, in order to get a more complete picture of who John was, uh, we had to look at Luke chapter 1 as well. We know that when Mary was pregnant with Jesus, Elizabeth was pregnant with John simultaneously. And that when Mary entered into the presence of Elizabeth, uh, the baby in her womb left because of the presence of Jesus in Mary's womb. So we could see that John, uh, even in the womb, there was already this purpose on his life. His life was leading to something. And the purpose of, of his life was to prepare a way for Jesus to make the way. That is what Isaiah prophesied and wrote about John. There would be one who prepares the way. That was John's purpose. That was the desire of his heart. And so we'll see just a little bit more about John this morning uh, as we look at the baptism of Jesus. But that is what we saw last week with the person of John. We saw what John did, that John baptized. Uh, we talked about the fact that the baptism that uh, John did was a baptism of water. He talked about and looked forward to Jesus, someone who would baptize uh, with fire. And we talked about the fact that John's baptism uh, went along with the call of repentance for the kingdom of heaven was at hand. Uh, and it, it was a symbolic gesture. And I, I talked a little bit last week in chapter 3 about the fact that because of Jesus, with us being on the other side of Jesus' ministry, uh, now when we baptize, we have a more complete picture as what, of what baptism is. We understand it on a deeper level. That to be baptized means a symbolic outward representation that we are dying to sin. We are going down in the grave with Jesus to sin. And we're being raised with him to new life. That's not a picture, a complete picture they would have had of baptism uh, in the time before Jesus' ministry. And finally, we saw last week that John held the religious leaders accountable. Uh, he talked about uh, the fruit. It says he saw the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, to John's baptism. He said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And John went on to talk a little bit more about fruit. He said, every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And so we looked at the fruit of the Spirit that is found in Galatians chapter 5. And we discussed uh, that is the fruit that is called called to well up in our lives. And we talked about the fact that when we become believers, it doesn't mean that instantly we're going to be really good at all the fruits of the Spirit. It doesn't mean that we come to know Jesus and instantly we're going to be patient people. Or that instantly the joy of the Lord is going to be in every corner of our lives, no matter what we're walking through. The fruit of the Spirit is something that, that takes given graciously by the Lord and it takes time to grow. And, and we have to regularly be looking in our own lives, at what fruit of the Spirit is the Lord really working on for me right now? And are there, are there things of the world that I'm still holding on to that might be holding me back from growing in that fruit of the Spirit? And that's what we, so that's what we saw last week in that the first two-thirds of chapter 3. And now we're going to look at the last third, starting in verse 13. And this morning we're looking at something that I can assure you, uh, not knowing him personally, this was the absolute climax of John's life. This was the pinnacle moment of John's experience. 
And we're looking this morning at the very beginning of the three years of ministry that would lead to Jesus' death and resurrection. So if you have your Bibles again, Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 17, the end of chapter 3. Matthew writes this. It says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you are coming to me. But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Uh, in this profound and incredible moment, Jesus is coming to John ready to take a leap into three years of very worthwhile and beautiful, but also very intense and world-altering ministry. And the way he is going to kick all of this off is with baptism. And again, we talked a little bit about baptism last week and the, the intention behind it. We're going to see that just naturally as we look at uh, the baptism of Jesus. However, as we look at Jesus' baptism in particular, one different than any other we have experienced, I, I want to focus more on this particular moment in time and the significance around everything that's happening within Jesus' baptism. Uh, last week, as we were talking about the person of John the Baptist, I mentioned the humility of John, and I think it's important to highlight just briefly to begin, uh, because again, in John, we have the last Old Testament prophet. This is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. It is the beginning of Jesus' ministry, and it's a new thing that is coming that we would look at the New Testament. I know it gets confusing because they're split, Old Testament, New Testament. God has been silent for 400 years. He's finally speaking again through John, uh, John the Baptist, who is the last Old Testament prophet who I talked about last week as the second most theologically significant person in the New Testament, second only to Jesus, and a man that we have to remember, and this really isn't uh, talked about too clearly in the Gospels, but through other historians, we get a sense, John, in his time of teaching, had a mass a fairly large group of disciples himself already, many of which would go on to follow Jesus and be with him throughout his ministry. But yet, despite all these things, when Jesus comes to him, the first thing we see is the humility of John. We already saw it a little bit last week. Uh, he says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I. And he says, whose sandals... I am not worthy to carry. He is saying, I want us to, to picture this for a second. Carrying someone's sandals, I want you to imagine that the, the, the ground that these people are walking on, how disgusting. We talk about this a lot when we talk about foot washing and Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. That they, frankly, would have been some gnarly feet. Same with the sandals. The sandals were certainly not going to be the, these beautiful, pristine things. This was, And John says, listen, I... He's so much greater than me. I shouldn't even be carrying his sandals. I shouldn't even be doing the lowest of the low job for him. And that's just his words. Last week before Jesus is, is physically before him, those are just John's words to the religious leaders and to his disciples. Listen, there's someone who's coming after me now. He's greater than me. And I, I'm not even worthy to carry his sandals. And then Jesus comes to John first thing he asks of him is, baptize me, John. And there's immediate resistance because of John's humility. It says John is preventing him, blocking him, saying, listen, you're coming here to me. I know my position. I know where I am in relation to you. You should be the one baptizing me. I am not worthy to carry your sandals, and yet you're telling me I want you to baptize me. John gets it. John understands, and it's a little bit of a, it's a little bit weird to read in the Gospels about someone who just gets it, because when we go on to look at the rest of Matthew, when we have looked at the other disciples, as we've talked about, Peter in particular, when we went through his letters a couple of years ago, 
talks pretty pretty frequently about the fact that one of the most frustrating things is to to read the gospels and to see the behavior of the disciples and the understanding of the disciples. And of course, I know that if you put me in the shoes of Peter, I'm denying Jesus three times. I'm not fully wrapping my head around it either. It's just difficult when we have a more complete picture of who Jesus is to look back in the Gospels and see how direct he was with them and the fact that they don't understand it. Jesus was very veiled. We're going to see it in the Sermon on the Mount as we begin to look at that in a few weeks. There are teachings that he had with the disciples that, that were difficult to understand. They were difficult to grasp. They were difficult things, I'm sure, for the disciples to swallow. But there are many times in the Gospels Jesus is implicitly clear with the disciples. When they finally say for the first time, when he calms the waters, you know, who, who am I? And they finally tell him, you are the Christ. You are the one we've been waiting for. You would think, okay, there's the moment. It's clicking now. They get it. And yet they go on to do so many things that show that they don't fully get it. Uh, it's the same with Jesus' death. Uh, when he began to speak very plainly to them about it later in his ministry, he didn't veil it. He, there were points when Jesus just started to say to them, listen, the Son of Man is going, I'm going, I'm going to be raised up, I'm going to die, and after three days, I'm going to rise again. He was using plain language to tell them this. And there was, at some level, a refusal to hear it. They didn't want it to be true, and so they just blocked it out of their heads almost. And so we see, even after his resurrection, Surprise! There is surprise. John and Peter go running because they want to see if this thing is actually true. And you read the Gospels and you're like, he was literally just telling you five days ago, on the third day I'm going to be raised up. And yet there's this surprise element. And so it's so refreshing to read and contrast that with John, who from the very beginning, he just gets it. He understands who Jesus is. He understood the identity of Jesus. And not only that, because there, at some level the disciples understood the identity of Jesus as the Messiah. But he actually listens to Jesus. Now later in John's life, that is going to be tested. That is going to be stretched. We'll see he, it is because of his life's purpose that, that John dies in the hands of, uh, of the king. But when Jesus says to him plainly here, John, you need to let this happen. John hears that. And he gets out of the way and allows what needs to happen to happen. Even though he knows, I'm not worthy of doing this. And yet he does so anyway. He walks down into the water and he baptizes Jesus. And in that moment, we see several things happen. We see several things take shape. And we see a lot of things about the identity of who Jesus is come a little bit more clearly in division. The first thing is in being baptized, we are seeing the deep humility of Jesus. Again, we talked about John's humility. Now I want to talk about Jesus' humility. Church, when we enter into baptism now, when we step into the water, when we are when we are dunked in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and we are pulled back up out of the water, we are saying and showing outwardly, this is me, this is representative of the fact that I have died to sin, and now I'm coming out of the water. I'm, I know that I'm entering into no, to new life. I have entered into new life. Life that only Jesus can bring. That is the statement we make when we are baptized today and when we baptize others. Baptism is done and encouraged for believers. We see it all throughout the New Testament. It, it is strongly encouraged, commanded for believers because it is an outward sign of something that the Lord is already already working deeply within us. And we want to remind ourselves that we are dead to sin and alive to God through, uh, through his son, Jesus. And so when Jesus chooses to be baptized and to begin his public ministry in baptism, what we have here is not like our baptism where it is, you know, a sinful person saying, I want to show that I'm dead to sin and that I'm alive in Jesus. What we have here in Matthew chapter 3 is the perfect, spotless Son of God, one who knew no sin, entering into the same water that so many sinners had entered into before him, 
and saying to John the Baptist, who was not the son of God, who was not a perfect and sinless and spotless lamb, that you need to baptize me. When we are baptized, that is a sign of an inward repentance. The Lord is working in and through us. But yet Jesus had nothing to repent of, no sin to die to. So why be baptized? Because right away, Jesus is starting his ministry, kicking off his ministry, showing us that he came to get down to our level. He didn't come to show us his greatness. He didn't come to live a perfect life and then say, there it is. That's what it looks like to live perfectly. I'm heading back and ascend before us and, and set a bar and say, good luck reaching that bar of your own strength. He said, I have come so that I can stand in solidarity with you so that I can understand the temptation and the burden and the struggle of sin. He came to show us what it looks like, again, as I prayed this morning, show us what it looks like to come alongside others, to meet them in the waters of life, to meet them at their point of need and see them through it and love them and be with them and provide for them. Jesus' ministry began with a moment of massive humility as he waded into the waters that so many sinners had waded into before to show us that he came for all who knew that they needed to die to sin and that they needed to find new life in him. And so as he comes up out of those waters that he entered into again with a perfect humility, and I would stress perfect humility, Jesus is perfect. John was humble. Uh, there's a difference between a perfect humility found in Jesus and the humility of John. Uh, the reality is uh, none of us at any point have done something from a completely 100% humble state of mind. Uh, it's, you know, I, I, in my full-time job, I have the, the, the pleasure uh, when we're going through hiring of interviewing people and getting to just hear different, different point of views, different personalities. And uh, there is nothing quite like hearing that sentence that you hear so often. I, I am a humble person. It, humility is one of those weird things we have to navigate of. If I'm talking about how humble I am, I am no longer humble. And it is a weird thing to navigate. But as Jesus comes up out of those waters that he entered into in perfect humility, we see now a out loud vocal affirmation of the Father. Uh, and so this is the second thing I want us to see this morning. When we read about the affirmation of Jesus here, that he enters into the waters, he, he's raised up, uh, and then it says here that as he was going up from the water, and so this, uh, there's different interpretations here that either the moment he was pulled out of the water or as they were uh, leaving the water together, this happened. Frankly, it, it doesn't matter because it happened, but as Jesus is coming out of the water, we see this moment of affirmation from the Father, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, descending like a dove, and it comes and it rests on Jesus. And again, we don't know if did it sit on his shoulder, did it sit on his head, where did it rest on him? But it says it came to rest on him, and a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And church, what I want us to see this morning is that this moment of affirmation in his baptism we get to find solace today in the fact that Jesus is enough. Uh, I shared, this was uh, something I preached on uh, several years ago, inspired by uh, Pastor Rich Stevenson. Uh, Rich has a book that he wrote many years ago called uh, A Voice From Whom, I believe is the title. And he shared it with us in Young Adults a couple of years ago. It was a really cool look at the three times in Jesus' ministry that God the Father audibly spoke over his son. Uh, and in all three instances, uh, it, it's, we see it here at his baptism at the beginning of his ministry. We see it at his transfiguration uh, before uh, his closest disciples when he's transfigured and we're seeing Jesus in all his glory. We see the father again speak over his son. Uh, and finally, we see it as well. Uh, and, and I would say my subjective favorite uh, part is it, entering into the last week of his life uh, Jesus cried out that the, that the name of the Father would be glorified through what he was about to go through. And the Father says, I have glorified it and I, I will glorify it again. Those are the three instances 
of a father audibly speaking over his son. We have the first here at his baptism. And there is, again, value in digging into all three of those instances. Um, when something happens three times like that, I would say it's, it's worth digging into and looking at those things. And we get value each time over what the father says over his son. However, the significance of this one being at the very start of Jesus' ministry cannot be lost on us. Jesus knew what was to come at the end of these three years. Jesus knew he was beginning a ministry that was going to last for a certain amount of time, and he very certainly knew how that time of ministry was going to end, that difficult times lie ahead. And yet, he still pressed on humbly at the beginning and was affirmed by the Father as a result. This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And again, it makes sense. Jesus is perfect. Jesus is the spotless Lamb. He knows no sin. And so to hear this affirmation from the Father over him uh, really shouldn't come as a surprise to us. It shouldn't catch us off guard that the Father would affirm him in this way. But the real weight should come in the fact that if we know Jesus as Lord and Savior, we can read the affirmation from the Father here and know that because of Jesus, we can be affirmed by those words as well. It's a reminder for us today, not because we are perfect, not because we are the spotless lamb, not by our own strength or greatness, but because the Father is saying, listen, Jesus, he is my beloved son. I am well pleased. He is enough. And to know him as Lord and Savior is to be in him, is to have relationship with the Father again. So we can know that Jesus is enough. And if we are in him, he is enough to give us eternal life, to give us relationship with the Father. One of the most incredible aspects of the cross is that because of the cross, because of that dark and hideous thing, we can now be called children of God. We are adopted, Paul talks extensively about it in Romans, in sometimes very confusing ways, but the short of it is, we, can, we are grafted into that family tree of Abraham. Uh, it's why we as children get to sing, Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had Father Abraham, I am one of them. There is a beauty of that, that we are now adopted into that that family, and one that, again, if we look at last week, John hitting at the heart of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, their pride came because they would tell people, listen, I'm a descendant of Abraham. It was their family line that they feel led them into this position of power, this position of authority, and now through Jesus, we're saying, yes, we are a part of that family line as well. We are grafted in, we are adopted into that family, we are added to that family tree because of Jesus. And because of this affirmation from the Father, we can know that that is true. This is my son. We can now read that affirmation from the Father. Again, one that was spoken over Jesus. This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. And again, we, we wanna be careful when we do this in the text that we're not reading ourselves directly into verses in the Bible, but we get to take this as a reminder that if we are in Jesus, the Father is now affirming over us saying, you are my beloved son, you are my beloved daughter, and I'm pleased with you, not because of who you are, but because of who Jesus is, because you've come to new life in Jesus. It's important that we remember that. Uh, that it's not because of who we are, it's because of who Jesus is and what he has done for us. It really is an extension of, and we talk about this as believers, especially as we know those who have, who have gone on to be with the Lord, uh, we talk about the beauty of entering into his presence and hearing those words, well done, good and faithful servant. It's really an extension of that. And this brings me this morning, church, to the final reminder I think we have here in the baptism of Jesus. And it is something that echoes what we talked about last week and looking at the fruit that the Lord is working within our lives, the fruit of the Spirit that we're called to as we live life by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's this, the Father is pleased and is affirming of Jesus because of his obedience and he is calling us now to that same obedience. Uh, obedience is one of those words. There are 
are words we use as believers from time to time that if we're not careful uh, can really bring up difficult reminders, difficult memories, difficult feelings for someone. Um, but in one of those words, I think, is obedience because we live in a world where uh, that word obedience can be a little bit weaponized against people from time to time. And it might be a hard word for some to hear this morning. And I think in particular of uh, the parent-child relationship here. As we talk about what that, what it looks like to be a child under parents, what it looks like to, to parent a child, uh, there are certainly in our world uh, that, that parental-child relationships that are a little bit more unhealthy. And so there may even be some here today that growing up there was this sense of um, I, I need to be obedient or else, or that uh, there is, you know, I owe my parents obedience regardless, regardless of what they say to me, regardless of what they, what they do to me. Uh, it extends as well. Uh, a couple of weeks ago when we were here on Wednesday night, uh, with Bobby's new son, just hearing his testimony, uh, we watched a video uh, about what it means to, to be in correct submission to governmental authorities. And uh, we talked about the fact that in Romans, it, it is very clear, Paul is, is saying, you know, to, to respect and listen to governmental authority, but that does not go, that's not to a, an infinite level. We see so many instances in the scripture where people resisted and were obedient to the Lord first. They submitted to the Lord first, and therefore they did his will. Uh, we see the main one in Acts, I, I think, when the governmental leaders say, listen, we're going to let you go. You can't preach in the name of Jesus anymore. And they say, listen, if it's between listening to you and listening to God, we're listening to God. We're going to go. We're going to preach in the name of Jesus. It's the same with obedience here when we talk about just that earthly parent-child dynamic with obedience. And it, it very much falls in line with the thinking of the way of the world, uh, which says, if I do not do this, if I'm not obedient, if I do not listen, I am not going to be loved. I think that is when we talk about that difficult parent-child dynamics, that is one that we see at differing degrees of, but if I am not obedient, if I don't do this, I'm not going to be loved the way that I need to be loved. And frankly, that is the way the world works. The world is very much transactional. If you give me obedience, I will give you love. Jesus is calling us in the Gospels to the exact opposite way of thinking because it's how he loves us. It says, we are not obedient. This is a message of the Gospel. We are not obedient because through our obedience, we hope that someday we might be saved. We are obedient because we already had the free gift of salvation given to us. And we had this desire to know Jesus, to have a relationship with him. And now because of that, because we've known his salvation, there should be that inward desire within us to be obedient to what he is calling us to. There are still many people sitting in the church today who have a very transactional view of the gospel. Uh, that the Bible is, at its core, a list of do's and do nots. I should do this. I shouldn't do this. I should go to church every Sunday. I should read my Bible every day. I should not uh, swear. I should not drink alcohol ever. Those things are impermissible. And if I go to church enough, if I read my Bible enough, and if I am careful to not swear more than I read my Bible, if I'm careful uh, to, to not drink, then at the end of my life, my goods are going to outweigh my bads and I will get into heaven. There are people sitting in pews today with that transactional view of what the gospel is and that is the antithesis of the actual gospel of Jesus Christ that says, not be obedient so that you might know salvation, but you have salvation and let that spur you to obedience to the things of God. Church, when we are stuck in that transactional way of thinking about the gospel, that is a really, really difficult way of thinking to break ourselves from because it is the way the world works. I, I, I give you my money, I receive something. I give you my obedience, I receive love. 
And so today, if, if you find yourself ever stuck in that way of thinking, I, I think I would encourage you today, remind yourself each and every day that we are called to obedience, not so that we can have hope that we might be adopted into the family of Jesus, into the family of God. Rather, know that if you know him as Lord and Savior, you are already on that family tree. You have, in the words of Paul, you've been grafted into that family tree. And he calls you to obedience because he is a good father who knows you deeper than you'll ever know yourself, who loves you, and who wants the best for you. He is that good father that even when we stray into that way of thinking of the things of the world, and it's the, it's the reminder of the prodigal son, even as we stray into the reminder of the prodigal son, and it says, you know what? Give me what I'm owed. I, I'm leaving. I, 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 you are effectively saying you are dead to me. I'm going out into the world to do what I want to do. He is still the good father who even after doing what the son wanted him to do, stood and watched and waited for his son to return home. And when he saw him coming around the path, didn't stand and wait, tapping his foot to say, I told you so. He ran to him, hit his knees with him, and said, welcome home, son. That is the father that we are called to be obedient to. And we are, again, called to obedience, not because it might earn us our salvation. It won't and it can't. We are called to obedience because we already have tasted and known his salvation and his goodness. That is what we are called to this morning. That is what the baptism of Jesus reminds us of this morning. As Emily comes, we prepare to close in worship. Would you again pray with me? Jesus, I thank you this morning for the reminders of your baptism. And Jesus, I thank you for the reminder that I need all too often that you, when I need you, you are not in some high and lofty place that is difficult for me to get to. Because of your baptism, I know that you have come to my level. You walk with me day by day. And though you had no sin with which to repent of, you entered into baptism to show us that you walk with us. And Lord, you took the sin that I could not give up, I could not repent of, and you took it to the cross for me so that I could repent, so that I could lay it at the foot of the cross and know new life in you. Jesus, I thank you for your perfect humility. I thank you for the affirmation of the Father over you. And because you were affirmed by the Father, we can now know that when we put our trust and our hope in you, we are affirmed by the Father as well. We are grafted into that family tree. And now we know that the Father is speaking over us. This is my son. This is my daughter. I love them. I'm well pleased with them. Not because of anything they have done, but because of who Jesus is. I thank you, Lord. And I, I pray, Lord, as we walk through difficult seasons, you would remind us of that affirmation often. Uh, so many things feel earth-shattering. Jesus, the truth that we are affirmed and we have salvation in you, that is earth and life giving and building, Jesus. And I pray that that would just be continually on our minds. And Father, if any here this morning, maybe because of a parental child relationship. Lord, if there's, any, if there's any parents in here this morning that struggle with that way of thinking of you owe me obedience and I will in return give you love. If there's anyone here struggling with that transactional view of obedience and love, Father, I pray this morning you would break them of that thinking, that you would bring them to a place of showing us that the gospel runs in exact opposition to this that we would love boldly, that we would be obedient because you, we know that you first loved us boldly. Jesus, would you bring us out of that place of seeing these things as transactional and see them the way we see, we see them in the gospel, Jesus. We love you. We thank you for this morning. Father, be with us now as we worship you with us now as we leave this place, as we head out into a world that desperately needs the truth of the gospel, that it is not give obedience to get love, but be obedient because you are loved already. Jesus, would you remind us of that this morning? I pray these things in your name. Amen.
Please stand as we close out the service together.